We live in a world where we are disconnected from the food on our plates and the stories they have to tell. As a consumer, we have so many choices, but do we understand the impact we can have with the decisions we make? I'm a filmmaker living in the international township of Oroville in Tamil Nadu, South India. Here, surrounded by acres of cashew trees, I was curious about this delicious nuts life story. As importers here in Europe continue to demand lower prices and greater quantities to meet skyrocketing demand, groups are calling on supermarkets to ensure fair trade practices and calling on shoppers to seek out fair trade nuts. Because at the other end of the supply chain, it's these women who bear the consequences. You and me, you know, ordinary people, wouldn't know how to get the nut out of the, you know, I mean, we just don't know how to do it. And even if we did, we probably wouldn't want to do it. You know, it's not like having walnuts or almonds or something like that, where you just crack the nut and take the nut out. You know, you can't do that with cashews. So it has this whole processing thing. And, you know, that's where people make money. <laughs> Stefan is a processor of cashews in Oroville, selling local, organic, hand-processed cashews. He wants to create a fair trade model where his workers are paid a decent salary with holiday and sick pay. This is very different from the rest of the industry, where workers are generally paid very poor seasonal contract wages per kilogram of cashews produced. We give the cashews to the breaking lady, who is uh, doing this with a traditional way, really hard work. On a, on a stone, with a stone in the hand, she puts the cashew in the shell on the stone, and boom, 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 and then she turns it around, boom, boom, boom. Then the shell is broken, and she, it, the shell falls apart, and then hopefully the nut is easily falling out. Sometimes it's stuck, and then she needs to peel it out, and usually the nut is breaking in this moment, or already before. Then we have the nut shell. It's in a red, it has still a red skin. They call it tester. The next step would be to peel the tester off and uh, then to dry the nut, and then to long-term store it, or to pack it and uh, give it to the shops. Cashew shell uh, contains uh, oil and an acid. The acid is very strong and it's very harmful for the skin and it creates also allergies. People who break the cashews in this way deal with it. That uh, you take ash with your fingers and while opening, um, the fingers are always covered with ash and the ash is neutralizing the acid. This is a traditional way and it keep and it gives a very high quality product I would say. But it costs unfortunately very much. <laughs> It 
It's a different product from a simple, from a cashew which has uh, been processed in an industrial way. Uh, they're big, big machines. First, the cashews in shell, they get steamed. So the shell gets soft and also the nut gets soft. It has two advantages. The shell can be cut easily with machines. And then not nut, because it's softened, it sticks and it's not falling apart. So it remains a whole nut. That's a big advantage for industrially processed um, cashews. But often the, the taste is not that good. The new generations, you know, it's getting lost a lot. People now understand, hey, what our grandparents and the many generations before did. It had all a reason, because it was more healthy. Alok, who was a big part of the Oroville cashew processing story, visited various processes around India, and he shares with us his insights. The organic exporters in India, they were not 100% organic. So what they did is they processed the, the non-organic on certain days and organic on certain days. Those companies are really very large processors. And for them, the only reason they, they got into organic was there was an export need. Because it was not a philosophy if they're doing 90% non-organic. Yeah? We still have some of the best processing centers in India, and it's still cheaper than other places. So what might happen is we're going to get cashews from other places that come in here and get processed and then sent out again. The cashews come to me through knowing people. I am, for me, it's very important to know the people. I don't take cashews from somebody who comes and says, hey, I have organic cashews. I have no trust. Testing is incredibly expensive, and that's a big, big problem for organic in general. If you buy from somebody, you never know really if it's organic. So it can be uh, only your trust, it can be your inner feeling, and the experience that how the food looks, how the seller looks, how the if there are perhaps sometimes signs of uh, uh, insects, signs of fungus, which might be sometimes a good sign. I wanted to experience cashew harvesting myself. Fortunately, I have access in my backyard. From April to June, the cashew trees are covered in red and yellow fruits, with a little cashew nut hanging at the bottom. The cashews are ready to be picked. The fruit is deliciously tart and edible, but has a very thin skin and perishes very fast. If left for a day, flies and maggots flourish, making separating the cashews from the fruit hard. Left too long on the tree, they fall to the ground and can get stolen. In peak summer, I harvested for three back-breaking hours every day. I started to appreciate the efforts of picking this nut. I quickly realized why traditionally cashew harvesting is a community job. <laughs> After processing, only one fifth of what is collected will make it into the final edible cashew nut. From the beginning of our adventure, we set ourselves the goal of being self-sufficient in food needs. Of course, there was no question of our using pesticides or any type of chemical fertilizers. Our researchers are consciously oriented towards organic agriculture. However, Oroville is not isolated from its neighbors. In Oroville's bioregion, cashews are a highly valued seasonal cash crop. Cashew trees were introduced 30 years ago when it was discovered they were much less labor-intensive than traditional crops. 
and grew well in the harsh soil conditions of this land. Over time, monoculture of cashews has emerged, leading to a certain times of the year when many people fall sick. Why is this? I wanted to find out. While on one side, we made the land green by planting trees, it seems uh, on the other side, the village fields became uh, cashew, cashew tops, cashew fields. Uh, and uh, they started spraying chemical pesticides on the cashew, cashew fields. And that was a huge controversy, conflict. I was able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who Mudila, customer. Trips, ek patta nahi chhodega. Shit kabri, sundi, gudi aur tindo ko chalni chalni kar degi. Heliotis to tabahi macha dega. Hmm? Naya ke? Aaj ham rahenge ya kaba? Khabar tha, jo aayega, mara jayega. Ye Nova Star ka farm. There is a general mindset, more or less all over the globe. Not only in India, not only here in our region that pest control, pesticides are needed for productive, successful farming. I think it is, it's basically a mindset. I don't think there are many good arguments for it. The local farmer would always argue, I have to guarantee my yield. So for them, it is like the more pesticide, the more yield, which of course is already wrong. It is not even, it is not promised by any uh, pesticide producing industry but they always believe there are pests and the pests will take over if you do not spray pesticides. That's Jasmine lives in a local farm in Oroville. She helped initiate the Healthy Cashew Network, a group aiming to help with Oroville's cashew story. One step was to understand what was happening in the community during the spraying months through a survey. Not this year, the previous year, when there was an unprecedented height of pesticide spraying. Everybody was saying, like people living in the green belt having cashews themselves and neighbors, they said never before had they seen so much, so consistent and regular spraying of pesticides, like in some fields daily. And we were wondering why. That's where this notion of uh, is endosulfan banned or about to be banned and is it that they dump it on the market or why is it that so much pesticide is being sprayed I really still don't know the answer. I just know that the effect it had on, on Oroville was really serious. I mean, it is always a serious effect, but it was extreme. People were getting sick and many for weeks. For example, organophosphate is the most common type of poison that is used for spraying on for agriculture. And its impact, it generally, it, is a, it, it produces a neuromuscular paralysis for insects and as well as humans. It is the number one cause of death in young people other than accidents uh, in many parts of the agricultural community. 
She does one among many victims of the use of endosulfan for two decades in the 80s and the 90s. He was directly exposed to the harmful chemical when it was sprayed aerially over the cashew nut crop. Badusha can't run, he can't play like other children. Permanently bedridden, this 12-year-old is symbolic of what many allege are the effects of endosulfan, a pesticide used by farmers in India. Organic panalan pada, yang itu organik le, poli itu kaya orang mana ada. Apa orang nak panal? Kata itu nang pucuk ini mandang pan berjaya orang orang itu kan. In spraying pesticides, the target pest gets less than one percent. They figure out something like point zero one percent of the pesticide. So ninety nine point nine percent of pesticides are wasted elsewhere and kill everything that shouldn't be killed. For particular pests, uh, many pests have become resistant. We have developed new pests. There's not a single original pest with, which has completely disappeared. But the larger damage is also environmentally that killing a pest means killing more than a pest. So you kill many insects, many beneficial insects. You put a toxin into the food chain which affects the birds and predators and is there in the environment. The ambition of the pesticide industry was to develop pesticides with short half-life in nature that break down faster than the old pesticides did. DDT has an awfully long half-life. It was banned because of that. But the pesticides are not less toxic than they used to be, the early ones but they just have usually shorter half-lives. Pests and pesticides are one part, but who has the power to make the change? One of the problems um, is that the people who own the trees are not the people who do the spraying and who want the spray. Because the people who own the trees put the, the picking out to contract. And then it's up to the people who have the contract to do the spraying and then to do the picking. Now, the people who have it on contract are the people who need the money for their kids so their kids can go to school. And they have been told by the government on the radio that it's quite safe um, and that they should spray this stuff. इन तो तोड़ का समस्या नहीं ला परिश्रम चाह रहा है मीला ये रेत को समस्या उन्हें कर देनी समर्थवंत का यदु कवड़ारी की सिनर्जी वारी पीमा सिनर्जी वारी उत्पत्तुलु वाड़ी रा पंटा उरी पिंतुनु सिरुलु मी इंटा अन्न मर्द ना जीन वाला अनाल पिन्ना ला नरिया दिंग ने तेरी वेरा वही के डेवेसा है दुगे Use did the spraying, of course, and for them the economical situation had priority over health. And uh, people did admit, yes, uh, a cow drank from the bucket where we had mixed pesticides, and and it died. And but what to do? And there's there's this kind of uh, what to do. This is life. It's difficult to point fingers and say, here is the full responsibility and why do they and they should know better. When you see that very often, okay, some knowledge is there, but these people, they just work under contract and they do what they're told to do. And often they pay a, big pay a really big price. Dr. Lucas, trained as a GP and practiced at Oroville Health Center in the 70s his path has led him to change his focus from treating symptoms to preventive action. On his experimental farm, he is testing and refining the use of natural pesticides for cashew trees. Having worked with farmers and researched the cashew story, he feels that for any impactful change, the power lies beyond the farmer. 
for us who live next to the cashew plantations, the cashew forests, it is an irritation a few days a year. It's not a big health risk. Some people suffer more, some less. It's a nuisance. The big health risk is for the guys who do the spraying on many plantations every year, for many years. It means for weeks they are living in these clouds of pesticides, inhaled on their skin, swallowed. If anybody gets trouble, serious trouble, it is them. மறுநாள்ட்டி <laughs> We are really must think about occupational hazard of the person who sprays. Very often, they are not very poorly protected. And uh, as, as part of it, the acute poisoning is essentially people develop breathlessness and they start getting uh, water filling up in the lung as part of fluid accumulating in the lung. And they come emergency into the hospital as part of poisoning. But there is a more chronic poisoning. In persistent people who are continuing to use this over a long time at much lower doses, develop neuroparalytic issues. With very classical findings of sweating, salivation, and breathing difficulty, they require the artificial ventilation for at least two to three, four days before they recover. But protection will prevent it. Make sure that you who wear goggles and put protective covers and mask for that as breathing this toxic air is and this droplets are avoided in maharashtra's yavatmal district exposure to toxic pesticides in fact had killed 34 farmers and sent over 175 people from that district to the hospital this event also exposed the horrific condition that uh, this agriculture district uh, has in fact where farmers are forced to work without protective gear and are supplied with untested toxic pesticides in those cell phones after the hue and cry in kerala there it got banned and the aerial spraying got banned uh and i don't know why it is banned in uh, europe it's not the worst of them you, there are four labels it has yellow mark everything needs to have this hue and cry and movement and then there is a half hearted ban but still it is available daily Protests have been held in more than 40 countries against the US food giant Monsanto and its genetically modified foods and pesticides. From Mexico City to Burkina Faso, demonstrators made their anger felt at what they say is the threat to biodiversity and ecosystems. Similar fears in Argentina have seen doctors sign a petition to get one herbicide which is created by Monsanto banned. In this era, if a woman gets pregnant during the period of crop fertilization, the risk is very high that she will have a disabled baby. The issue is without pesticides, the mod the current agricultural system does not seem to work. And unfortunately, the insects are sharper and faster growing resistant to these pesticides. And it harms both human and and the agriculturalists. At the end, both people suffer. So, if it's not the people who spray, can it be the landowners who make the decisions to shift practices? Um we are talking a lot about uh, people who are spraying and more spraying often out of uh, um lack of education. 
okay, I don't know, let's put a little bit more than recommended, so we are on the secure side. But on the other, se other side, I must say, there is a huge, huge, huge movement in India of people who, are not, who don't like to go this way. So two extreme polarities, basically, of one part people who don't care at all, and on the other part, hundreds of thousands of farmers, in the meantime, of people who go an organic way and who really don't want to go the conventional, unfortunately, normal way today. And if you get to know the people, if you really get in touch with them and you talk and you learn about their past, about what they do, they show you around. So if you get a personal contact and you learn about the person and sometimes you really understand that's not a person who would send you something different from what he claims. And that's the way what I want to go parallel to certified organic raw materials. Rita has been part of the Oroville Cashew story for the past 30 years with her late husband. They tried to experiment, inform and educate the bioregional farmers about organic alternatives to pesticides. We asked Oroville for a piece of land where we could demonstrate um, organic uh, cashew growing and we received a plot very close to the solar kitchen. And we worked on this plot for 12 years. It was a one acre plot. The first year, we just harvested as it was, and we got 160 kilos of uh, harvest. And uh, then we, we worked on the plot. We pruned the dead branches, and we produced compost natural compost with the twigs, leaves, cow dung. And then we gave this compost to the trees, spread it around. And uh, already the next year, the yield went up and the yield gradually went up. We were successful. Some people converted, they used neem oil or they understood the, that actually spraying had uh, no effect. They only spent money. They, they got what cashews they would get anyway. So they stopped spraying also. chemicals <laughs> Priya is an Oravillian farmer who shares with us a holistic way of farming and pest management. We don't do any spraying here. We don't believe in it. What we try and do in um, Buddha Garden is to replicate nature. And if you look at nature, one of the things that really gets you about nature is the diversity. So we try and make that diversity. What that does is it brings in more insect species. And the more insect species you have, the fewer um, pests you have. A healthy plant in a healthy soil is how you eradicate pests, but that takes time. To be financially sustainable is to have a variety of different things that come at different times of the year, so you've always got something. And also, if something fails, as things do from time to time, you've got something else. The people here, they're not so far away from their natural uh, lives and uh, agriculture. So how did they do earlier? They, they used organic compost to, to feed the, their crops and neem oil. Neem oil has been um, known since ages and the local people knew it. The memory was not so far away. Neem is not the only natural pesticide. 
I met with Gauri, who makes his own bio-nutrient and insect repellent. So the main ingredient of this uh, liquid is made from Calatrophis plant, which is also mixed with you know, five more different plants to make sure that it has the full effect because every plant does a different job. And of course, these are alkaloids extracted uh, from these plants and which helps, which is enough for the insects to repel the insects. Basically, when we apply this on our plants, it, it prevents other insects to come and eat the leaves it works with uh, termites and uh, it works with uh, root borer for the bananas and root borers for the cashew, which is the main issue what the farmers have. Even with the very high toxic chemicals, they are not able to kill these insects. The presence of alkaloids in this uh, liquid also helps to boost the immunity of the plants and it increases the yield also. Armba kalau tu, naga bandi, ada tire bandi jadi kerja kalau tu lah. Orang yang kerja, arnu lelit tenil tu, naga mandi aja. Anja kalau ni kalau kerja tu, mana dia nak kalau mudi le, arah mana adik pampa adik arah mana aja. Anak tractor saya set punye, mandi aja, mesin mesin mule ma. Ipo anja yang kerja, randa lelit tenil aja, mandi ni tu celung adi ma aja. Tapi modal aja mandi adik kerja, mandi tu celung aja, arah bandi arah, segala muka arah baik aja. Puan awalnya panen dah raya itu muka, orang muka mandiri betul. Dan awalnya arah 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 itu ni orang ikut. Selalu ni mungkin kalau ni ada selalu dah ada. Mandi barang, mandi diri barang, air water, tank, kuli, alu kuli, segala macam korai perhati lah. Segala macam awalnya awalnya air ini kerja. Anak mandiri betul ni dia, bila air ini kerja. Nampak awalnya mandi ramai kasih marah kerja. Mandi pucuk mandi diri itu mandi kasih mandi adik mata ada kerja. Anak arah kani kerja mandi mandi ini ada kasih kami mata ada kerja. Anak rehat nallah ikut kerja. Semua orang yang kami bandari kan, ada semua makan aku ini nalar kan. So if these pesticides are so bad for the environment, the farmer's budget and health, why are they still so widely used? Pesticides really are not efficient, and uh, it is it's largely a myth, and there's a lot of what I would call brainwashing involved, and of course a huge lobby behind. You're up against a very powerful lobby, which is the government, who say it's okay, and who actually encourage farmers to use it, and the um, manufacturers, who of course want to sell as much as they can, and obviously in cahoots with the government. And on the larger scale, on the governmental scale, it is, uh, food security or productivity. Productivity means, of course, revenue, means income, and cashew is a, one of the biggest foreign, foreign revenue, foreign currency earners of, uh, of India. But you know how it is when certain things are established by lobbies, by profit-making people, uh, common sense people, they don't really have a, much of a chance to easily undo the, what is established. And, and this uh, fight is going on everywhere, also in Europe. An anti-chemicals movement that began in the countryside and has spread to the city. Lille, Nantes, Grenoble and Clermont-Ferrand joined Paris in implementing a ban on pesticides within their city boundaries. We have to plan it for like the next 10 years and say, okay, if we want this whole area to be pesticide free, how do we do that? And I think one of the ways to do it is to, to build relationships with the farmers. You can't ask somebody to convert if you don't know who they are. <laughs> Aku buat ini sebenarnya kerja macam orang nak nak buat macam orang buat sahaja pandai macam cari pakai telur orang buat macam orang nak macam ini orang 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 macam ini KVKs, the centers which give advice to local farmers to reduce or to stop pesticides. That would have a meaning, because that is the voice of authority. And that will be accepted. Farmers said it in the 90s to me, 
If the government will advise differently, we'll do it differently. The research shows that the number of insect species is going down. We're losing our diversity. It's not sustainable ecologically because, you know, what's happening is we're destroying, we're destroying the nature, we're destroying the earth on which we all depend. For me, it's clear to take care of me, I have to take care of my environment. Marinda ada je, kuda orang muda kat sini, air kaya, panjang orang muda kaya, macam macam tapul lah. Nama kami orang Tripura juga, kami keluar mandi dengan lah cedian sahaja jadi kan. Ramai orang ini lalu kan. Alah mandi, yeru tan, nanti je, yeru muda alu guna pora yang pergi. Unda mpo apa ada kari kan, top. Every crop is being sprayed with pesticides. In all food items, we have pesticides. In all environment, we have pesticides, and not just on some cashew plantations. The environment will tolerate it. Biosphere will take it. Life is extremely resilient and adaptive, but we are overdoing it. It's a warfare with pesticides all over the globe. It is impossible. It, it is not, it should not be tolerated. You know, you can tell them to convert and not spray pesticides and all, but somebody has to come along and buy it at a higher price. Organik yang kita, itu dan dari rating government lagi kita, orang mana itu company yang orang itu cuma orang, pandu dia lalu mana itu orang. Ini kalau itu tanah rating lalu kita, semua orang itu tanah itu, anak anak kita organik, pandu mudi lalu. Of course, we can have a conscious consumer behaviour. It's a smart idea to only buy organic cashews to ask in the shop where the cashews are from. The cashew market is driven by demand, and we, as consumers, have some power to affect change in the global cashew industry through our choices. Can we be aware of our role in this story? It's something when you grow up perhaps in Europe like me, and you know cashews only from the pouch you open and you eat, and you have no clue what it is really. And suddenly you come to a place where they grow and are processed. It's just to get the touch with the food you know since childhood. It's so nice, you know? it's uh, something special. In the globalized industrial world, we increasingly have little understanding of the food we eat. Within the cashew story, there are many stories from processing to growing, the cashew nut has passed through many hands. Each hand has a role to play, a story to tell, a choice to make. Are you ready to help change the ending of this cashew story?